Kyle and welcome to Prepare Like a Pro live chats. My name is Jack McLean. I created Prepare Like a Pro earlier in the year. We are a strength and conditioning business that specialise in athlete development for football. If you're interested in working with us, head over to our website, preparelikeapro.com, where you can check out our training packages as well as online training programs and face-to-face -face training. I'm going to invite Ben Darwin to join us. Just sending the invite over, Ben. Here we go. Connecting. One sec, mate. I'll just go through your intro and then we'll get cracking yeah. straight into the, uh, the question. So for yeah. those that don't know, Ben, he's a retired um, professional player. He represented the ACT Brumbies in Super Rugby and played at international level for the Wallabies. He has a considerable experience uh, in coaching, play development and analysis. This includes a variety of coaching and performance analysis positions with Western Force, Melbourne Rebels and in Japan with the NTT Shining Arcs as well as the Sun Tory Sun Goliath, driven by a desire to introduce a greater degree of empirical analysis, which is what a fair bit of our talk will be tonight uh, on data analytics and bringing it into professional sport. Ben established Gainline Analytics after more than a decade of involvement in professional sports. So really keen to hear uh, his story and, and journey from a player through to a coach to, to their analysis. He had the hands-on founder. He's involved in every level of the business, whether it be developing predictive models, presenting research findings or consulting with clients. So thanks for jumping in, mate, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to this chat. It's a pleasure. Take us back to the beginning, mate. When did you find out that you had a passion for either coaching or, or analysis when it comes to professional team sports? Obviously, it came really off the back of my playing experience. I was actually saying to someone yesterday, sometimes I wish I'd actually coached and then played because coaching yep. gives you such a great sense of, of what you actually require from people. And also, I think... When you start coaching, you realize that most players are just kids, basically, <laughs> in adult bodies. Because of my injury, I, I retired at 28, and yep. so I still felt like I had something left in the tank to give. And I really didn't know anything about analysis too much, except I have a sort of inquisitive mind. Mm -hmm. I also didn't know until further down the track that I actually have ADHD. Yep. And ADHD sort of is something that I, I see as a huge advantage. I think it's great, but it helps you to think in a, in a sort of an analytic way and think of, think of things in terms of the, the big picture. Yep. And I'd always wondered about as a player, it didn't make sense to me about why Australia was good at rugby. Just in terms of how many people we had playing the game, and and it was never really known by the by the players, to be honest with you. And then also too is that at different times I had coaches that I didn't think were that great, but they were very successful. So I wanted. Yeah, to yeah, that. yeah. I started doing data analysis itself though in 2008, in when they had the global financial crisis. So I was in Japan, and the team I was working with, I was just a coach, and I thought it'd be great to add another string to my bow, just in case they're going to fire me, or just in case you can have another have another aspect to what you can do. And yep. so I just started teaching it myself. And then I, my my wife and I uh, got engaged, and she was from Melbourne. I went back to Melbourne and, and and met with one of the coaches who was who was going to start out there, and he said, "I heard you can do analysis." And I said, "Oh yeah," bluffing a little bit. And then he said, yeah. uh, "Well, do you?" come work for us you're the analyst if you want it and i'm like okay what i didn't know is i'll also probably be i was going to have to be it as well and it was an amazing experience actually i've done it twice but being part of teams where you're literally three people sitting at a table with a bit of paper and a pen and, yeah, and that's uh -huh. you start from there you don't have a name you don't have a playing list and to build be part of building two clubs from that scenario was a really interesting interesting experience actually yeah where do you start far out that is an interesting experience so there's a fair bit to unpack there. That's what, what about with the, the analysis side of things? So you said you had an inquisitive mind. What was performance analyst or data analyst doing in your playing days? Did you connect with someone that was doing the role or was it just self-research that you were first exposed to it? Interest, yeah. Interestingly, so, so, the, so the video analysis kind of just started to come in. Okay. It just started to go off. I mean, video analysis has always been around, but you would watch a video and then sometimes they'd chop up clips. But then what really started to change it in rugby was when they could code games yep. and then you could then take a whole bunch of footage and then take that uh, overlay the code on it and so you could really start to database so the old mm -hmm. days if you wanted to look at a team's lineouts you have to cut up all the lineouts put them together map them yourself whereas when you could then code over them you could or get other people to code them you could very quickly access massive amounts of video yep. and you could sort that video so left hand side five man lineouts in the 22 that were like okay let's look at that data and then they could add other pieces of information to that code and then the code got more and more depth to it what i found though with most data analytics is 
and and this is interesting for me with teams of all types is that most it didn't really represent my experiences as a player mm. that it's it's it gives data to tell you the outcome but it never really told you for example why certain teams were good or certain teams were bad i find data analysis oftentimes a description of what's going on of the way a team is playing but i think so much of the time and this might sound a strange thing to say the closer you move to correlative data the further you move from causative data right which might sound nuts mm -hmm. but if you say, okay, why is a team winning? Well, if you want to find the closest correlation, having a higher score than the opposition is very correlated, right? But that's yeah. not causative. Or putting the ball down over the line, the white line more often than the opposition is very correlated to success. Mm. But that's not causative. And then you go back to that and you say, okay, what about line breaks? Well, line breaks is very correlated, but it's not causative. You've got to keep coming back to the why are each of these things taking place? And is that the bigger picture? Yeah, each team's going to do something different. The Crusaders win in a different way to how the Bulls win, to how the Wallabies win. And so the fact that they're doing it in a certain way, you, you need to understand how you're going to play, but that doesn't really come back to, to what is going to help you to win. So if you say, well, we're going to kick as much as the Bulls kick, Bulls win because they're winning the comp right now, it doesn't work like that. You can go and do that and still come last. We found one year that the team that offloaded the, uh, offloaded the most, which was generally seen as a positive, actually came last in the comp by a long way, which at the time was the, was the Lions. So what I'm really focused on understanding with our work is more about why do clubs win successfully? Why are the Crusaders so successful? Why, why do some clubs struggle? Why do some clubs struggle to produce talent? And then also coaches. Why do some coaches seem to be very successful and then not so successful at other clubs? Why do they you know, bounce around and what's actually causing success or failure? And then how can you separate those out? Yeah, yeah. And... and as a coach, when you were coaching, would you bring the data analytics to sort of, I guess, prove the role that you were doing, in a sense, to well, the, when you present the, to boards? Or The problem with coaches is most of the time if they're presenting the boards, they're trying to defend themselves. I've been yeah. part of scenarios as a data analyst where the coach was like, hey, you just kind of paint this like I'm doing pretty well. You yeah. know, we have, a, we have a thing called a game line curse, which is if a coach comes to us and asks us to present to his board, he's got a month till he's fired. Like it's happened eight yeah, or nine it's, times. It's like, you're done, buddy. Yeah, yep. so we try not to take that sort of angle. We'll help if we can. But most of the time, the board's already made up their mind about that person mm. anyway. Um, yeah. There's some markers that we've actually been looking at around coaches that said, okay, well, if, you, if your team is under these markers, not in terms of score, but in terms of cohesion, there's fundamentally nothing you can do to stop the, co to stop the board firing you. You're, 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 the team you have built or the team you have due to injuries or construction is so bad that nothing's basically going to stop you. No matter you are as a coach, nothing's really going to stop you losing your job. So that's not necessarily a, a, a positive. Now, when I was a coach, one of the things that's quite dangerous in data is what's called the Goodhart's Law. I don't know if you've heard of Goodhart's Law, but what Goodhart's no. Law will do is you set a KPI and the KPI starts to deviate the behavior from the whole. Okay. So what I mean by that is, let's say I'm a on out coach of a team. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if the overall goal is to win games, but I'm set the KPI of winning line outs. Right? Now in line outs in rugby, the easiest place to win the ball is at the front. So if I'm more worried about the, hitting my KPI or the team winning, I'll just throw the ball to the front. Now that is completely counterproductive to the team. The yeah, yeah, the yeah. Okay. But I've seen it happen where a coach will basically direct the players to do a certain aspect, which will make sure he hits his target, but will be to the detriment of the whole, right? Yeah. So in Victoria, one thing that happened with the police was the police set a KPI by the government of hitting 1.5 million breath tests every year, right? Now, the problem is that a completely unachievable marker. So what they mm. would do is go and do the breath tests, and then when they finish it around as police, and do a thousand breath tests together. But it'd be them blowing in the breath. <laughs> yeah. The overall goal of police is to protect and serve. You're not doing that whilst you're sitting around in a circle. And even the leaders were doing it. They figured out they yeah. falsified about 300,000 breath tests. So that's, uh, where you, that's where KPIs can be quite dangerous yeah. and start to just shift the behavior that doesn't necessarily help the whole. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, in terms of like something that I've been aware of from your work, the teamwork index and getting a successful teams building that cohesion which is a bit of a buzzword probably for a long time yeah. like connection cohesion yeah is that something when you're working with a developing team or, or maybe it's a clean slate when you're you're in that position where you're setting a club up where do you start is it is it getting guys that have come from the same academy to come to the club first is it is does, is there is there index with coaching staff as well when you're setting up a club um, yeah Certainly, if, if players have played under a certain coach, then they'll understand the system and, and they won't necessarily have to make as much adjustment. But there's a number of a club. If you look at, for example, how the, 
is they took a bunch of guys together at, an, at other clubs and brought them in so they had boy audience. And then they were very stable and they adjusted and off they went and they actually managed to win the comp inside of two years. If you want to be successful straight away, taking people from somewhere else together is quite helpful. It sort of gets yeah. you off the mark. Anytime you start a professional team, you really should start it on top of either a professional competition or a well-structured competition. I think that they have difficulties with the Melbourne Rebels is the local competition is not producing professional players. So then they have to continuously import them much more than they have to use what they have locally. And so it's, and then you see it with AFL, when the AFL, when the VFL ceased to exist in 2000, the next six comps were won by interstate teams because we know that was having a yeah. really positive impact. And the two teams that didn't change them and Hawthorne had a lot more control over Box Hill. And so they ran Box Hill basically as Hawthorne A, so to speak, or Hawthorne Academy team. Whereas if you've got a reserve team, you want it to be playing the same way as that team. There's a whole bunch of, like there's, there's 30 or 40 different opponents to what's going to help. But for me, if you build a club with a bunch of players with large amount of experience from all around the league, you couldn't be starting off the club in a worse way because what you've yeah. now got is a bunch of old guys. And if you look at the, the Brisbane Lions, Brisbane Bears from, say, 87 to 95, if you look at the way in which the, the swan, early Swans were built, it was, even if it was not discards, they were, and some of them, some of the players were reasonably strong, throwing together older players, the, the, the gold cottons were sort of reasonably similar. But the biggest question is where does it all get you? So if you, if you mm. start with a bunch of old players and then they're together for two or three years, you might win a couple of games, but then you've got to completely reload again. But the, the difficulty is when you're starting the AFL is the AFL is the most stable league on the planet. So to bring an expansion yeah. franchise in the AFL is so hard because the damn thing's built so well and takes so long. If you look at GWS and, and the Gold Coast is they have really struggled with it. But the, one of the biggest keys, certainly know when, when um, I've had conversations with Brisbane, is they found if they, if they got kids out of Melbourne, they'd always end up going back. He yeah. country boys in the country boy get a chance of staying. So given that scenario, you really have to work on getting the competition underneath your competition so much better because otherwise you're just importing. When you import, they return. When they're returning all the time, it's unstable. If it's unstable, it's successful, and it's hard to attract. It's hard to be successful over the long term. Really, sustainable success starts at the gra grassroots and gets worked and works through. So it's, it is a very yeah. very difficult job. And the better the league, the harder it is. That makes a lot of sense. And that sort of ties into what you're saying before. In So if you do have your development academy teams, but if the coach in the academy team has KPI of winning the most games, they might be playing a different style. to have a, So how do you, you might have the things in place, but then how do you have a KPIs that suggest that it's, it is development for the future, that those team, those reserve teams are... A hundred percent. His job his job should be pro to provide players for the team above. Yeah. And, and his job description should be about that. And so one thing is when you start to deviate that goal, is he might play guys in the positions that he thinks are going to be effective. Whereas mm. if they say, well, hang on a sec, we, we don't have any young full forwards coming through, so you're going to make one. Now, if you're going to make one, you're going to have a kid playing out of position. Because playing out of position mm. is going to be terrible. So you're going to cop, you have to swallow some pain. And so what coaches would say to me is like, they told me to do this and I did it and then we lost and then they got embarrassed and they fired me. They, they make up their mind about what they want and then also what they're willing to absorb. And you know, the first question I ask to people when I go and talk to boards, why are you on the board? Why are you here? Why are you here because you want to be able to tell your mates that you're, that you're on a board? Do you want to be there mm. in the grand, you want to be there in the grand final? Do you want to be there holding the trophy at the end? Are you prepared to sit and watch your team lose by 100? Are you prepared to cop flack from your fans? And, the, and are you prepared to do things? Are you, would you be prepared to pay the price now for four years for success that comes when you're not even here anymore? Yeah. And yeah. You want people who are on the board because they love the club and they want the club to be successful in that, and that isn't necessarily always the case. Yeah, and I imagine that needs to be the case across all levels. Yeah, the bigger the club, the more the pressure for the fans. And, and I think that Richmond had probably one of the best examples of a club that did what we would call cycling, which is going round and round in the circle of we don't have any good players, therefore we need to buy new players. And then mm. when those players turn up, they don't play very well, which then stifles the development of the younger players, which means they have to import more players. So, just go, so they did that for 33 years, right? But they finally, in sort of that, you know, 10 to 15, started to get their stuff together. But even in 15, some people were still trying to overthrow the board. It was Sorry, 17, they still yeah. tried to overthrow the board because the success wasn't coming at the speed they wanted. And yet they still, and they didn't do that and they won the comp. You know, imagine the universe where they did overthrow the board and they did win. The, imagine if they then won the comp the year they overthrew the board. Like, how would that look? But they've, they've stuck strong. 
Uh, the same thing happened in, I think, 07. They almost fired Bomber Tom before they won three of the next five titles. And so what I find with coaching is that, is that it's quite a rare scenario where you have people unable to judge somebody's task. So you have your boards mm. theoretically judging the ability of the coach to be successful when they really fundamentally have no notion of what success looks like or whether they're actually good at their job. And we'll find with boards that generally sit back while they're winning and they don't, they'll say, oh, just go talk to them, go talk to the coaches, and we'll say, what are you judging the coach? If he loses by 50 yeah. this weekend, is that appropriate or not? And I think we certainly found that with, we were, there's a great podcast called Sacked, and we basically went through each coach that was sacked from his job and found most of the time that coach was winning this, the same or more games than he should. 